I'd like to welcome you to a, an interesting new idea that we came up with. The church has always been about growth. You would agree, yes or no? The church has always been about growth at, at its core, its mission is growth. It comes from Revelation 14, teaching, training. And GYC has always seen itself helping and aiding in that. We teach young people, we train young people. We want to be the church of today that can aid our church. And so what we've done is we, we've always worked with church leadership. Amen? We have godly leaders in our church, and we wanted to bring them forward for, for a moment for some real interaction. We want the panel to, some of you are evangelists, some of you are trainers, some of you are teachers, some of you are preachers. We want to dispel that this morning. In a very real way, we want to get to know you, we want to get to know who you are, what makes you tick, what, why you serve the church. We have had the privilege to work with church members and, and church leadership for quite some time. I think of Dr. Rossi, I think of Dr. Pippum, I think of Elder Gallimore. All along the way, godly church leaders have been helping us and, and mentoring us. And so what we've done this morning is we've taken questions from you, we've taken questions from young people around the world, and we've distilled them down to very specific questions that, that we want to answer. Because we want them to be relevant people. Just like us, they're real people. And so for a moment, we want to sit here at, with you at this table, it, kind of like a child would inquisit their parents. And, and we want to be very real. We, we just want real answers from real people this morning. So we've assembled questions from around the world. You will get a pulse. You will get a sense of what the young people here in this, this auditorium and, and, and literally around the world, how they're thinking and what they struggle with. And, and we want to do that, and, and we want to launch into that if, if you'll allow us. I, I want to, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. I know some of you had other things that you changed your schedule to be here. It, it means a lot to us that you're here supporting us. I think in my presidency at GYC, two highlights stick out in my mind. This conference, because it's, it's being such a spiritual blessing and, and such a GC representation. The other is some of you, or actually I think all of you, voted me to serve as a GYC voice in Atlanta at the upcoming session. And I'm just ecstatic about that, 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 that us here as young people have a voice at the GC session. And so for that, I thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I humbly and honorably take that in, in serve as a voice. So thank you very much for that. So if you'll allow me, we'll get started. Uh, and, and if I can, I, actually I should introduce you to who we have here. We have Mike Ryan, Elder Mike Ryan, Dr. Mike Ryan, Dr. Ted Wilson, Dr. Ratsara, Dr. Mark Finley, although I passed for Mark Finley for me, I think, <laughs> Dr. Ella Simmons, Dr. Bill Knott, Dr. Don Schneider. Each serve as is GC vice presidents. Uh, Elder Knott serves as the communication piece, specifically of the GC, and then Elder Schneider and Elder Retsara serve as division presidents, which are branches of the GC. Well, we might get into that a little bit later, but that's who we have here. We have Israel and we have Amy. We have Israel because GYC all along the way has had support from the church and, and has seek the counsel of the church. So we have him to, to show that. We have Amy. And so this morning also, I, I, there's kind of an unwritten thing that will happen. There's a, a proper way to associate with church members, it, church leadership, and we want to show that in a very real practical way this morning. So if I could, I'll ask the first question to get us started. We've kind of had a conference and we focused on being unashamed. We've focused on commitment to spiritual levels or uh, spiritual things. In a, in a practical way. We've talked about creation. We've talked about being unashamed of the gospel. And I think this question kind of fits within that. And I, I would open it up to anyone, but as leaders of the General Conference, would you speak to the commitment level of the GC leadership as well as the global leadership to the authority of Scripture, even when it cuts across cultural practices?
culture should never dictate Scripture. John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Thy word is truth. The General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist is clear on the authority of Scripture. Scripture always transcends culture. Now, there can be cultural aspects in which Paul says, I become all things to all men. So methods can be adapted, not theology. Thank you. I wish, uh, Elder Finley, someone else would have asked that question because I was supposed to ask the follow-up question to you. Uh, but here goes anyway. Uh, recently, uh, most of us are aware of, recently there have been some public criticisms on the Internet regarding the amounts of money spent on public evangelism in the form of net-type campaigns. Uh, are there other successful methods that are, most, that are more cost-effective cost in uh, public evangelism? Well, most of the people who are criticizing public evangelism are not doing it. Yes. There's a lot of critics, and if they had a better method and were winning more souls, praise the Lord. But when you look at net evangelism, we already have the airtime on 3ABN or Hope Channel, and if you uplink one series, you might have 5,000, 3,000, 2,000 churches and groups and in their homes participating. And I would ask Jesus, what's the worth of a soul? And I'd ask the young people here, how many of you have ever attended a net evangelistic event? Can I see your hands? How many of you have ever been blessed by it? How many of you have been ever baptized as the result of a net event? Can I see your hands? Was it too expensive for you? Certainly not. So do we look for better methods of evangelism? Definitely. Should we find better methods? Certainly. But Jesus' words, Mark 16, verse 16, go preach the gospel, still ring with relevance. There are some of us here who owe an immense amount to public evangelism. I spent a moment a while back thinking about the fact my, matern my paternal grandfather came into the Adventist church through the ministry of H.M.J. Richards, the father of H.M.S. Sr. My maternal grandmother and my mother through the ministry of Glenn Kuhn. My wife, through the ministry of Mark Finley, I owe an amazing amount to public evangelism, and I always will. Amen. If I can just... May I, may I just add a, just a note? I wonder why we always uh, feel that there must be an either-or, as opposed to using all of the methods that are available to us. I believe that is the example that we receive from Jesus. Elder Ratsara, um, I think with you being a division president, you might be able to help us answer this question. Many young adults are ignorant of how the church works beyond their local church and pastor. Can you help us understand the necessity of our system of church structure, which includes local church, conference, union, division, and the general conference? Thank you so much. Um, our God is a God of order, and he has given us a wonderful structure to support the mission of the church. Uh, when it comes to the structure of the church, uh, we have four levels, four levels of, of our structure, uh, which one of them, one of the level is divided actually into two. We will know that uh, later on. Uh, we have first the local church. The local churches are made up of individual members of the church. And then we, we have the local conferences or local missions or fields or section, depends on where uh, they, we are talking, but it is the, the same level. So the local conference is made up of local churches. Uh, we have uh, many, uh, we have many conferences all around the world. And then we have the union. The union is a union is made up of local conferences and the union is called as the building block of the general conference and then the the fourth level from the top is the general conference which is uh, divided uh, into 13 uh, division uh, the, a division is a branch of the general conference. So you can see it is well structured to push forward for our mission to go forward. This is a wonderful uh, structure that the Lord has given us. 
Thank you. It, it's always good and interesting, I think, for us to understand that structure, because I think it, it exists for a reason and a purpose. And, and if I can set the tone on the panel a little bit and get, get real with you guys for a second, and gal, we, uh, we understand that the church exists to protect our fundamental beliefs. And, and I just want to read a question, and we got many that came in, because I think it's on the hearts of people. Some, not all of our colleges and universities continue to hire and protect professors who do not believe in our core beliefs, such as creation. Many youth have lost their faith under such teachers. How can this be stopped? I tend to think that that comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was open to anyone. There but is. Um, of course, not enough time to deal adequately with that question, yet I believe we can lay some fundamental uh, blocks of understanding here. First of all, uh, my personal stand and the stand of the church is that Seventh-day Adventist schools at all levels, including colleges and universities, exist for one purpose. In most countries of the world today, there are excellent systems of education, but we operate Seventh-day Adventist educational institutions to pass on, to teach Seventh-day Adventist world perspective, spiritual uh, understanding, scriptural knowledge, and so forth. Ellen White says, and we must hold on to this, that education and redemption are one. If our schools are not thoroughly and uniquely Seventh-day Adventist, they should not exist. We have no reason for them other than that they are thoroughly Seventh-day Adventist. Then that indicates that in order to give Seventh-day Adventist education, we need, we have an imperative for Seventh-day Adventist committed practicing Seventh-day Adventist faculty, leadership, and staff. We have all been in a position in which individuals have been hired into our schools who have not been Seventh-day Adventists. We appreciate our colleagues, but either they will betray themselves as good Christians by teaching what we believe if they are not Seventh-day Adventists, or they betray us by teaching something other than Seventh-day Adventist belief in our schools. It is clear from Genesis to Revelation that academics and spirituality are one. The divisions that you hear about, that we read about, are false. They are work a tool of the devil, clearly. I could go on and on, but maybe I should let someone else have a point on this. We have a responsibility to make our schools, all of them, everywhere, thoroughly Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate that. I think the, the key for me that you responded to, if they're not teaching it, they're, they're essentially not Adventist institutions as we yeah. know it. And if I could, if I could go with a follow-up question on that. Actually, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Well, I just I wanted to make a quick you. comment that sometimes when you are addressing this issue, it's important to keep in mind that it's not just church leadership that addresses it, but it's lay people and church leadership working together and that's what will provide a solution that will be of a permanent nature and one that is progressive for the kingdom. So what can we do as young people? Uh, th there's a very practical way in which church members can address the needs and the confusing situations at times on campuses, and that is to work through the system. Uh, it's so important to have leadership at colleges and universities who are absolutely committed to the 28 fundamental beliefs, to the Word of God, to the three angels' messages. And there are many of our administrators who are like that. But it is important that you work through them and through the Board of Trustees. Those people are responsible for those institutions. And that is where you, in a practical way, can actually influence the people by simply talking to them, calling them, emailing them, dialoguing with them. It will make a difference. You need to make your voice known. May I just add a point? You said as young people. 
-hmm. And I'm thinking as young people, as students, you have a responsibility to stand for truth in these institutions, in the classrooms. If you stand and if you are honest in your communication of what is happening, those who have responsibility and the desire to make a difference will have, uh, shall we say, the foundation from which to operate to make a difference. Often, those of us who travel around the world, who sit in various offices, who are not out of touch with the church, but who are focused in different places at different times, really do not know exactly what is happening in a given classroom. But if you stand for truth, if you stand for what is right, everyone here will stand behind you. Thank you. We appreciate that. When you mean stand for truth, we, we hear, um, uh, you know, make your voice heard, stand for truth. All, all these things are very positive and encouraging for us uh, working through the system. I think the bottom line question is, what does that mean? What, how do we do that? How do we work through the system in a proper way? Does it mean in a classroom setting, uh, if my professor is saying something that is clearly uh, not in line with what I understand the Bible to be. Do I stand in class and say something? Do I write them a letter? What are ways in which we can stand for truth and work through the system? And how does this all tie into? This is kind of like the question that, that was being asked regarding the church structure. We don't understand the church structure. How, can we write a letter to our GC president, to our NAD president? Who, what, what would be working through the system? I want to start with a personal example, and then anyone here can answer those specific questions. I, and I want to say welcome to Louisville, everyone. This is my town. This is my hometown. I grew up here. My family was not Seventh-day Adventist. I joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church at age 16. So I made a decision as a young person. I did not have the blessing of Seventh-day Adventist education. I attended universities right here, Indiana University, the University of Louisville. I did get Andrews in there later on. But right here in this town, I did my doctoral work. First of all, you must always conduct yourself as Jesus would. You don't need to attack the professor in class. I had to deal with this um, in, a, in a real situation. For example, I can remember I would always say when called upon to answer those questions, evolution, let's just go right there. Uh, I, I believe that as a scholar, I need to know the theories of ev evolution, but never to accept them as fact. Hmm? So I would always have to say in class and on my test papers, according to you, this is what has happened. Although I still believe that in six days, God created the heaven and earth and so forth. And there's a way to do it without creating a problem. And people will respect you even while they continue to disagree with you. To follow up on what Ella has said, there's a difference between a teacher who makes a comment in class that I may not fully understand and they may have a different perception of truth than I do and a blatant open statement that violates the tenets of scripture and the Adventist church. A comment on academic freedom. In a sense, academic freedom is a myth. And here's why. When I agree to teach in a Seventh-day Adventist college, by that very agreement, I agree to be supported by Seventh-day Adventist tuition dollars from Seventh-day Adventist parents who want a Seventh-day Adventist education. So I voluntarily, by choice, a give up freedom to teach contrary to Seventh-day Adventist values. And if I can't do that, the thing to do and be intellectually honest is to say, I no longer believe that and go teach someplace else where that can be accepted. So academic freedom. There are Catholic universities whose boards meet who dismissed recently teachers because they weren't teaching Catholic theology in a Catholic university. There are Presbyterian boards and Lutheran boards who meet. And 
So the issue is, yes, as Adventists, we work together, we work in harmony and love, but the intellectually honest thing to do for somebody who may no longer believe Adventist theology is to find a place where they can teach in harmony what they believe. Elder Schneider, I'd like to ask a question that's related to that. Um, for those professors who may not take that uh, integrity position and remove themselves from that, uh, I think this question is directed that way. Recently, there has been an online petition asking the General Conference to tolerate monogam monogamous homosexual relationships. Some of the signers are ministers and professors of our schools. Some sit on boards and or of organizations that teach very divergent doctrines. What should be done when church employees receiving a check from the church openly seeks to undermine the very teachings they endorse? All the people that we talk about are people. And we need to deal with all of the people in a Christian way, even people that are very, very different in their way of thinking than we might be. If I am given an opportunity to deal with an issue like that, I, I really want to deal with it by talking with the person in a in a setting where that person and I can visit back and forth as opposed to a trial setting. Right. It seems like to me a trial setting causes a conflict that may not be necessary. Since I've been in the jobs that I've been in for the last 30 years or so, it has been my job to deal with people, some of them I've asked to quit. Very rarely, almost always as we visit, I can find a time to ask a question, are you having a lot of fun doing what you're doing? People who are not supportive of this church are by and large not having fun either and people who are not enjoying what they're doing are not, are not doing a good job supporting this church often. And that leads me to another point then. I say, hey, if you're not having fun and you're not really into the mission of this church, would you want me to help you find something else? Almost always that has taken care of the issue for me. Almost never have I said, okay, next Tuesday we go to trial, be ready because we're coming at you. That just hasn't been necessary in my experience. Thank you. I, I guess to kind of sum these questions up in a sense, it, it, we ask them as young people because there's a sense of concern. We love the, the church, we love creation, we love God creating man and women uh, to, to marry and, and obvious things to deal with the homosexuality thing. Sometimes we get a sense that these things aren't being dealt enough quickly or dealt with quickly enough. And I, I think it, it goes with young people that, I mean, if this is happening, let's do something right now. But we also ask that question as mentors. Why is there a sense from young people that it doesn't feel like it's happening quick enough? Why isn't something, you know, the, we talked about the creation of homosexuality. Why isn't something being doing quicker? Uh, probably one of the basic reasons touching on this, touching on creation, uh, on many other subjects has to do with something that we started out with, and that is the authority of Scripture. And as society has permeated the church, as we have become more, quote, sophisticated, we have lost a sense of the Word of God in a literal understanding as being authoritative in our lives and in our institutions. And I think as uh, we address these situations, they have to be done within the light of Scripture. The scripture is very clear on homosexuality. 
it doesn't mean that we cannot deal with the situation in a Christ-like manner, as Elder Schneider has said and, and others. It needs to be done carefully. But society should not impact the way we view truth. And scripture has to be presented first. And I think more and more administrators need to understand that. When they do, and when they fully accept that, things will move a little more quickly than you're seeing at the present time. Uh, the, the conference that took place at Andrews University in October uh, is a prime example of how some individuals who are very interested in the area of marriage and homosexuality uh, were able to put together a very profound conference that came down very strongly on the Word of God, but with care and with love. But it's very clear what God says. Maybe just to follow up from Elder Ryan. Yeah. You know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't come to this subject in neutral. We have a position, and it's biblical. We know what it is. But I think Elder Snyder's counsel is very, very good. I wonder what the disciples thought. There had to be some of them that were just a little suspicious about Judas. And yet Christ went year after year and didn't take care of it. I wonder if we can't learn something from that. I think Elder Snyder's counsel is very good in the fact that let's deal with people as Christ would deal with them. It doesn't change the truth. We have a position. We know what it is. But I think our first responsibility is when we finish to say, did I act like Jesus? I would like just to, to add, uh, I, I really believe that uh, we as a church, we need to take a firm stand. And we have done that uh, as a corporate. We have those statements that we have written. Uh, on top of what we, we need to do um, as leaders and as members, as we, uh, we have already stated, uh, Elder Schneider and Dr. Ryan said, uh, I do believe that we, we need to apply this principle. The best way to combat error is to emphasize the truth. So I need, uh, I feel the need that we need to do more in emphasizing the truth. We need to uh, spend more time um, and uh, die, I, I would say, studying more and talk about this. And gradually, when we emphasize truth, then we are bringing light and gradually darkness will, will go away. So uh, on top of the administrative approach that we are doing, and by the way, in our division, uh, that is the approach we are doing. But on top of that, we need to emphasize the truth, and the truth will triumph. There is an example from early Adventist history that is very instructive. Although the Seventh-day Adventist Church today faces at times the introduction of doctrinal heresies, this is not new in the church. Over a hundred years ago, John Harvey Kellogg introduced into the Adventist Church pantheistic theories. When they came in, they came in subtly at first, and there were those Adventist leaders that said, meet this, hit it head on, purge the church. They came to Ellen White, and Ellen White said, not yet. Why? Her heart was pastoral. She wanted to save as many people as possible. The apostasy was not fully developed, and she recognized that if church leadership moved too quickly, people along the way would be lost. Many people may grasp the fringes of an idea, but it takes time to work with them, as Elder Snyder has mentioned, in kindness and love. So why doesn't the church move more quickly at times? It's because the loving heart of Christ longs to redeem everybody possible and to work with people. But there was a point where the pantheistic heresy was affecting so many young people that the church had to meet it. And Ellen White said she was given a dream by God, and he said, meet the apostasy. 
meet it head on. So there comes a blend, and it's, and I know we're dealing with, with young people who want us to be real. We are real leaders. We love this church. We believe in the supremacy of the Word of God. But we also have hearts of pastors. We want to see our teachers, many of whom, the vast majority of whom, love Jesus and are committed to this church. There may be some who, who teach some things that are not totally in harmony with the fundamentals. But even they have hearts to be redeemed for God's kingdom. And so we have that delicate balance of walking that tightrope between the pastoral love that reaches out to redeem and the protecting the church from apostasy. Please pray that as leaders we'll know when to be tender and when to meet it. I'd like to um, follow up that question, Elder Finley. I think it's great and I think it's enlightening to us uh, and to me somewhat assuring that there is a pastoral approach rather than just an oversight which is what the fear of the young people sometimes is. As a follow-up question, uh, sometimes there is a perception that some, not all, church leaders seem to be negative towards supporting ministries that have a track record for upholding the teachings, policies, and leadership of our church, while other entities and even workers who undermine our teachings seem to get lost a lot of affirmation. And then how can this be? What can be done to call everyone to the same accountability? Sometimes it seems as though we're pastoral in situations where, uh, you know, as you just mentioned, while at the same time not showing the same type of pastoral ministry toward other ministries that might in some ways um, try to support the church in its distinctive teachings. I think one of the most important things when we get back to practical counsel is really you're asking about how do we make a difference, you know, when a school or whatever. And the same thing has to do with, with any kind of supporting ministry activity. You have to let people know what you're doing, who you are. You've got to make contact. Leaders are, are people, like you're trying to prove today. Uh, you simply have to get closer to people and explain it. Uh, I th let me just say it's absolutely wonderful to be at GYC. I've been here since Wednesday night and I have been thrilled. Uh, I've been so encouraged by the commitment of the young people to the church and to the principles of the church and to scripture and to what the Advent movement really is all about. Now once people get a flavor of that, all doubts are going to be dismissed. And you have publicly stated from this platform that GYC supports the Seventh-day Adventist Church and always will. Once people understand that, they're not going to be as hesitant. And it's the same with many other supporting ministries. People simply don't know exactly what you're doing. Some people, unfortunately, are opposed simply because their worldview is completely different. And you just have to accept that. But I would highly encourage supporting ministries, and GYC has already proven it, that you are so loyal to the church and its values and its mission, people shouldn't have a question. Just, I appreciate that, but I want to make sure that we're also addressing the other part of the question, which is, uh, in some cases, I know we, seem, we seek to be pastoral, and I believe that's great. Uh, I think it's great. We need to win our brothers and sisters. Um, and sometimes, uh, as young people, we overlook that, and so we appreciate uh, we appreciate you bringing that to our attention, Elder Finley, which uh, sometimes causes us a little bit of self-reflection. I guess the, the, the part of the question that strikes me more than anything is sometimes ministries are given affirmation by certain parts of church leadership. That's a perception that we sometimes receive, that there is not just a pastoral treatment of the situation, but actually affirmation is given to people who are divergent or ministries or situations that are divergent from our fundamental beliefs. You have to distinguish, Israel, between the affirmation given by an individual and the endorsement given by the church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church at the General Conference does not muzzle its leadership. So you're going to have people with, who may give individual affirmation, 
but the Seventh-day Adventist Church of the General Conference gives endorsement to supporting ministries through the ASI organization. The reason we are here today is to give endorsement to this ministry. Now, there are two other aspects of this that I want to discuss. What is a supporting ministry? How do you define a supporting ministry? A supporting ministry is a ministry that is in harmony with the mission, message, and organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but generates its own financial support. So there is no difference in loyalty to mission, message, and organization. The only difference is that it generates its own financial support. An independent ministry, by definition, is one who stands outside of the church and becomes a corrective on the church and criticizes the church. So you have two ends of the spectrum. You have independent ministries who see the church in apostasy and who correct it, the who attempt to correct it. The fundamental issue there is unsanctified pride. On the other end of the spectrum, you have liberalism who believes it has grown beyond the church, that its positions are archaic and wants to reform the church by getting it to, go to deny its fundamental beliefs. That also is pride. So whether you look at the ultra-right, the critical independents, or the ultra-left, the liberals, the fundamental issue is pride. And we at the General Conference want to bring people toward the center of the 28 fundamental beliefs that support this church and the mission to take the gospel to the world. One of the ways in which those of us who work in General Conference-based ministries are learning to think about our work is to identify what God is doing in the church and try to get in on it. That means coming to GYC. That means listening carefully. That means praying in the hallways with young people. That means letting our own hearts and minds be affected by the movement and the phenomenon we're experiencing here. In that way, we become supportive ministries of what you're doing, and that's the definition we intend to work with. You know, I, I have had uh, a opportunity to work in a lot of frontline mission projects. And uh, many people will come to me and they'll say, well, we have a, a supporting ministry that wants to come and help us. Is it okay? We don't know who they are. Well, you know, there's a, there is a system that, uh, that uh, we have within the church that sort of uh, gives approval to uh, supporting ministries. ASI is an is a organization that we use to say, look at them. If you're part of ASI, then uh, we, we sometimes give a nod. But actually, there's a much more biblical uh, explanation in the end, in the very end. Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, there's not light in them. And many times a supporting ministry will prove itself or not prove itself based on that principle. And there's a reputation that begins to, to move forward. But uh, I, I think that uh, there's no question that as people rally around the mission, the message, and they're interested passionately in proclaiming Christ to the world, and they take that up, they will become partners with the church. Uh, just as a follow-up to that, are we sure that all the ministries that are represented at the general conference session are supportive of the church mission? Are you talking about uh, ministries at, let's say, an exhibit uh, session? Or? Yes. Uh, there is a committee that works very carefully to try and screen those who are there, and uh, they do their best. And certainly, the ASI standard is uh, held very high. Uh, there may be some things that slip in here and there, and uh, they shouldn't. But by and large, uh, by God's grace, we hope that the committee does a good job. It, it's very careful in the way things are planned for the general conference session. And I'm sure you choose um, godly people to sit on that committee, and I know each of you are in um, a leadership position. As Justin said at the beginning, we look up to you as very godly leaders, and I think I can speak for the three of us and many of the young people here that we too desire to become godly leaders one day. What do you look for when you're hiring someone? How can we develop into those godly leaders? How can we seek mentorship from people like yourselves or from other people who can help train us to be those people? Um, what, what would you suggest for us to do? Yes, um, that is a very good question um, because 
uh, you know, the future of the church is in Jesus Christ through leadership. So that is uh, in, for example, in ESID, the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division. Uh, it is a, a major portion of uh, the role of the leadership to mentor young people and young leaders because a success without a successor is a failure. Uh, so what we, uh, I, have, uh, I have found at least three qualities that we want to develop in leadership. First of all, the church is a spiritual organization. So the first qualification, the first quality that we need to develop is spirituality. We need to be very close to the Lord. We need to allow God to lead us so that we can lead people. We don't want to mislead the church. So spirituality is a very important and vital aspect when it comes to the quality of leadership. And then, secondly, is love. We need to lead by love. Jesus Christ is the top leader, is the example. And that's why we are still worshiping him now, because you led by love. He sacrificed himself. So we need to develop, by the grace of God, this loving spirit. Because once people know that you love them, then they will follow you. So love is very important. And then thirdly is excellence. Uh, we need to ask God to help us to be effective and efficient, getting things done, well organized, so that uh, we, we can bring success to the work of the Lord because you cannot debate success. So three things, spirituality, loving sacrifice, and work hard. Can I just jump in on this? Uh, I think God uses people who are humble. He doesn't need people who have every kind of an answer for everything. He can use people who are even less educated than one might want to be able to accomplish things. Humility, I think, is one of the most important things, which means complete submission to God. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, people who are good listeners, people who don't just jump to conclusions, people who don't just categorize things immediately, but they listen carefully. And uh, people certainly who love God and love human beings, that's so important. Integrity, uh, I, I think Micah 6.8 sums it up, sums it up. Do justly, be fair, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And those are the kinds of leaders that God is going to use. He's just going to pull them out, and there are plenty of them right here in GYC. If I could add one more quality to what my brothers have suggested, it's tenacity. Many times as a young person, you may, be, you may have a, a God-driven idea, a dream in your life and your mind, and you may approach a church leader and may discover initially either not the overwhelming acceptance you are seeking or even an affirmation that you think it deserves. Be tenacious. Come back a second time and a third time if necessary. Pray with that individual. Go back and look at your idea. Share it with other godly friends. Don't stop with the first no you get. The system works if we are tenacious, and I have experienced that in my own life as a young person working with student government on Adventist campuses. The system will work if we will go back and carefully plan, redraft, redirect, and come back a second and a third time. You will discover the success God intended for your idea. Let me just put a little pretext to, to your response, because I, I want to direct a question in this realm specifically to you, Dr. Simmons, because we have uh, godly women in our leadership in GYC. Our, our first president was a female. And I see you're a female amongst men on the, that side of the panel. So I, I just wonder from your perspective, you know, can you maybe address the, the female leadership? Certainly. Let me um, address this in a general way first. Mm -hmm. But perhaps this is really important, maybe more important for women today, since you uh, state the question with that perspective. Uh, young people, when you have all 
of the rich knowledge base that you must have, all of the professional and vocational skills, all of the dispositions of humility, and you are tenacious. Remember that you must be committed to your God and only. We want to be real. We see in our church so often individuals, male and female, clamoring for position. That is not of God. There is a difference between your call and being tenacious about staying on track, pursuing that which God has called you to do, than setting your sights on a position and then manipulating your way through the system, your network, your contacts, whatever, to get there. That is not of God. So I say to all, and particularly to women, because I do have a burden for the young women for whom I am simply a forerunner. God has special things that he wants to do through you for this church and for this world. Our system is not exactly structured uh, to receive women as openly as it receives men. That comes from tradition and a comfort with the way things have been. But our church is changing. And young women, then, you must be prepared to take up that work that God has set before you. I love all that Paul says about the Christian ex existence, but this is particularly applicable to coming into the work, as we call it, working for the church. Paul says for us to run the race, in Hebrews 12, run the race that has been marked out for us. We think about running the race, but in that he says that has been marked out for you. God has a specific plan for each one of us, including for women. Yes, you must be ten tenacious women. Do not allow the system, the systems of this world, or the traditional systems of the church to deter you from doing what God has called you to do. And then please do not act in unseemly ways in trying to move into that which God has called you. I remember in this country when women's liberation was a big thing and women went out to the streets and marched, voices had to be heard. But there's a way to do things, particularly for Christian women. And I remember one of the foremost leaders in this country made a statement. She said, women, we have arrived. We have now become the men that we wanted to marry. If I ever hear an Adventist woman say that, I think it's over for all of us. <laughs> no, we don't want to become men. We don't want to outdo men. We want to take our positions alongside the men of the church and do what God created women in the beginning to do. We are not to take over but we are not to be dominated either. We are to be equal partners in what God has called every individual in this church to do. So prepare yourself, but please remember to maintain your feminine Christian dignity in doing that. That does not mean that you are weak. In fact, it means that you must be tougher than the men. And Ellen White says this, there are times that the women are stronger than the men. Maybe because we start off in a weaker position and God has to give us more, I don't know. But we must be tough, but we must remember who we are and whose we are. If I can for a moment, Mr. President, say hi to my wife who's on t watching us on TV right now. I love you, Judy. Where's the camera? <laughs> I have a question here uh, for us. Maybe uh, uh, our division presidents, I know some have served in divisions who are no longer in divisions, but this might be something appropriate for you to answer also. In the light of the Catholic priest molestation, the televangelist dishonesty, and all the secular scandals that have recently been on uh, television, 
what can we do as Adventists to improve and to safeguard our own global church system with transparency and accountability that reassures us as membership? A, a church is like a family. And actually, when we read the Bible, uh, the Bible says all, many times the family of God. For a family to be not only to survive, but to thrive, we need transparency and accountability. So we need to take the church as a family where accountability and transparency are required. How are we doing, to, um, how are we doing that? You see, we have a system already, but many times, sometimes we, we don't really make good use of the system. We have already a check and balance in our system through the representative, because our form of governance is representative from the local church. Uh, when we have a, a conference session, we have the delegates from the local churches and then the union sessions. So through the sessions, that is already one. And then through the boards and the committees, uh, that is a check and balance already. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes we have this system, but we, we don't really make good use of it. So we need to re look into the way we conduct our businesses, that uh, transparency is required, uh, that uh, accountability is required. We have the auditing system in our church that all the organizations must be audited, including, by the way, the local church once uh, once a year, at least according to the church manual, but the conferences and, and up must be audited. And then the last thing that I want to, I want to emphasize, and uh, we are trying to do this uh, in SID, the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division, is to really to be intentional uh, about the evaluation and the assessment. Uh, that is very important. Sometimes you say, oh, this is a church. Uh, don't evaluate us. No, this is, also, um, this is also a body. We need to go into the evaluation system uh, strongly. And lastly, uh, we need to be more open in, in the sharing of information. We need to uh, allow uh, the door to be open in a two-way communication. And that's why a leader must not be threatened by hard questions. Uh, and actually, we need to invite those questions because we, we are together in this. We are a family. If we foster that kind of spirit, then transparency and accountability will be upheld. Before you uh, respond, Elder Finley, it's great that the church has a system of accountability, and we appreciate that system. Uh, you mentioned sessions and boards, etc. And uh, in some ways, uh, I think those are great systems, and I think they're, they're, they're there for a reason. I was just thinking, as you were mentioning these things, uh, Elder Ratsara, we're, we're happy uh, Justin's going to be at the GC session. But I started thinking to myself, uh, in Michigan Conference, we have our membership will have maybe about three delegates or so to the general conference session. I think one of them, if I'm not mistaken, um, one of them might probably be our president, Elder Gallimore which means there's two. Then out of those, one of them has to be an employee. Uh, and then, you know, all of the criteria. So three people have to divide that up. And the reason why I say this, by the time we get to the general conference, and then by the time from the general conference we get into even, let's say, some of the important meetings, like even nominating committees, I'm thinking, what is the likelihood of anyone uh, getting into a nominating committee from just a regularity? That might be a, a, an easy thing to happen, but from my perspective. And then someone to have a voice even in that type of large committee, three, four hundred people. I don't know how many sit in those committees. So I think it's great that we have these type of um, checks and balances, but are they really checks and balances? I guess that's a question that I was kind of asking. Is it really a system of checks and balances and, and, uh, as, as it is intended to be? The, the general conference session has just over 2,000 delegates. Many of those delegates are mandated by the Constitution of the General Conference. 
that constitution is formulated by the general conference session. It has been formulated down through the uh, years and can only be changed by a general conference session. All the delegates who are representatives of the world field, and when you think of the fact that Seventh-day Adventists have a church of 16 million members, we have a representative form of government, but although we have over 2,000 delegates, many of which are uh, determined by the Constitution, there are some delegates that are reserved to be appointed, over 300 of them, by the General Conference itself. And it's a very interesting thing. Our General Conference President, Dr. Jan Paulson, recently met with each of the division presidents and urged them to look at the delegates that were not assigned by position mandated by the Constitution and consciously choose youth to participate in the session. So there are those numbers which many people don't realize. We have a certain number that we can allocate that Constitution doesn't mandate, and we're looking specifically at young people because we want them to participate in the process. If I can just kind of draw us into a little bit of a conclusion here and, and kind of go back where we started. We, we started with comments about the mission of the church. Obviously, we're all here for different reasons, and, and we all support the mission of the church and, and all these things. We spoke about our ways for us to do that. And you mentioned there's 16 million Adventists. We're excited about that number, um, but it's weak, to be honest. There's, there's a lot in the world. There's a lot in the United States that haven't heard the name of Jesus. They, they, they don't have the opportunity to hear about the Seventh-day Adventist message. And I think in closing, it'd be good for you to encourage us, you know, what's being done. It, it's not a good number. We don't like it. And in closing, what's being done, and specifically, what can we as young people do to help you finish this mission? The Seventh-day Adventist Church believes that it has been given a mission mandated by God. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. GYC can serve as a forum for young people, urging, encouraging, training to have one passion and one goal, and that's to preach the gospel to the world. Amen. Amen. Your participation in our conference, your participation in this panel has meant a lot. We hope you've sensed a pulse of the young people here at GYC.